Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Modern Customer Podcast. I'm your host, Blake Morgan. Today, my guest is Naomi Wheelis. She is the global head of customer success at Square. She leads a team of nearly 2,000 employees across 13 countries, fully remote. And today, we're talking about the Modern Contact Center leadership and management strategy that will take your contact center to the next level. We're looking at trends in AI. We're looking at data and analytics. If you run a contact center or want to learn how to better run your contact center and customer service strategy, you do not want to miss this episode. Please enjoy Naomi Wheelis. Naomi, welcome to the Modern Customer Podcast. We were just chatting that my daughter is Naomi also. So like I have a particular fondness for your name. So very welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Appreciate you having me here. Are you calling in from the Bay Area today? No, I'm in Atlanta. Oh, okay. So do you work from your home office there or does Square have I, a location there? Well, we do have a location here. There's several hundred employees here in Atlanta, but I do work out of my house. Okay, awesome. Well, welcome to the show. I took a peek at your background and I really wanted to start by looking actually at the beginning because you were a call center director at Safelight and Bank of America. You were head of operations for Capital One. These are, especially Safelight and Capital One, like if you look at customer experience uh, content, they come up again and again as some of the more customer focused brands. I know Bank of America recently is doing a lot more. Could you just talk about your your customer? Um, could you just talk about your career journey and how you got started in the contact center world? Yeah, happy to. It was actually a complete accident. This was not what I planned to do, but I'm very happy to be doing it. Um, Safe Flight was a contact center relatively close to the campus that I went to for undergrad uh, at Ohio State, and everybody was getting jobs there. So I thought, okay, I'll get a job over there too. I thought I was going to work there for like one or two semesters, and uh, I ended up being there nearly my entire four years of undergrad, and I moved up and was promoted several times, but by the time I graduated, I was running the call center, um, and I really fell in love with this body of work and have stayed with it ever since. So moved around to different uh, different states as I was working my, up, my way up the career, um, the corporate ladder, um, and have, have just fallen in love with the ability to have a really powerful seat at the table to affect the company's overall strategy, but also overseeing such a huge part of the employee population, which allows me to do a lot of leading and developing and coaching people, which is what I enjoy most. So my audience are mostly contact center people. I know they would love to hear what are what is the secret sauce of the better run contact centers, especially the call center? And I just want to start there because anytime I get a call center expert on the podcast, like it's just it's such an exciting time for my audience. So let's just start there. What is the secret sauce of the world's most customer centric contact centers? Uh, I think it's quite a few things that are in that recipe, the different ingredients. The first I would say is having a leadership team that is a hybrid of people who are highly experienced in the call center, who probably grew up in that organization, have moved through the ranks and bring that firsthand knowledge, uh, mixed with a nice subset of people off the streets who are bringing industry um, expertise from other businesses, other corporations, um, and having those two meld together often uh, relates uh, results in healthy debates and fresh perspectives without losing historical context. So I think having a very thoughtful strategy to who you put in charge um, and where those folks come from uh, at, from a background perspective is very important. Secondarily, I would say the ability to over empower the folks on the phone. Oftentimes a trap that contact centers fall into is everything is very regimented, policies and procedures for everything. There's an SOP for everything. Um, and that takes away the freedom and the enjoyment, quite frankly, in the, the phone agents, um, their workflow. It also stifles the customer experience because they're having to constantly be placed on hold or being told that somebody would get back to them because their requests need to be escalated to someone else who actually is empowered. So we try to be incredibly thoughtful at Square within reason, of course, but uh, with empowering the folks actually interacting with our customers so that they can have the most efficient, enjoyable conversations up front. It makes them feel emboldened in their own role 
and it obviously results in a better customer experience. All right, so let's let's fast forward to what you're doing now at Square. Um, I read you manage 2,000 employees across 13 countries. Uh, let's just start with what actually is Square for our audience who might not know, even though most people do know Square, and then your role in customer success. Yeah, of course. So starting off with the company, Square is a global technology company uh, that really makes commerce and financial services easy and accessible for businesses. We opened our doors back in 2009 uh, when the world of commerce was really just beginning to evolve. Uh, and Square has really grown with that over the time. Um, so what started out as a little white card reader, which is what we're most known for, uh, has now turned into this powerful ecosystem of more than 35 products that customers need to power their businesses. And so we build purpose-built software for people who are solo entrepreneurs running their own little mom and pop shop, all the way up to huge NFL stadiums and uh, multi-franchise organizations as well. Um, we offer a number of e-commerce tools, financial services, and banking products. Uh, we also acquired Afterpay, so buy now, pay, buy now, pay later is a functionality that is now available to our customers, um, as well as everything from empowering your restaurant to paying your team through payroll. Um, so like I said, it's a huge ecosystem of more than 35 products, uh, any solution that you really need. Um, we offer, and the beauty of that is that everything ties together, um, and so your systems are talking to each other and understanding your business at a really in-depth level. Mm -hmm. uh, in my role as Global Head of Customer Success, I have the privilege of overseeing um, one of the largest teams at the organization that's really in charge of the customer experience. So we're the voice that customers hear, we're the words that they see, uh, we're the people that they talk to when they are having questions or they're interested in becoming a customer. Um, and so we operate 24 seven around the clock um, globally to meet that need. Wow, okay. So if for our audience, our listeners and viewers, if they were to look at your strategy on let's say a one page document, what would that one page document include? Oh, wow, boiling it down. Um, yes. So our strategy, <laughs> that's a tough one. Our strategy primarily centers around turning questions into commerce. And what we mean by that is that when a customer calls in, 99% of the time it's because they have a question. We obviously want to give them the answer that they need so that they can get back to business. But we want to turn it into commerce for both of them, but also for us. And for them, what we mean by that is that we do a really good job, what separates us from our competitors, of getting to know that seller, of having a deep conversation that answers their, their initial question. But we take the time to get to know them, to understand where their needs are. Um, and generally, through that process, we find out that there's something else within our ecosystem that might be able to help them be more efficient in their business um, or take some manual task off of their plate. And that allows them to not only deepen their relationship with Square, but also become a more even, uh, an even more efficient business owner. And so turning questions is like into commerce in a really enjoyable fashion is what we pride ourselves on doing uh, in each and every interaction. And the, the outputs of that are um, a growing customer base through cross-selling and upselling, um, customers that are adopting more of our wide ecosystem, um, greater profitability for them because as they become more efficient, they're able to meet the needs of their customers uh, at a greater level. Um, and so we're, we take pride in seeing them flourish. All right, so customer success at Square, you have 2,000, I imagine a lot of them, they're contact center agents, but customer success means something different, it seems like, at every company. What does it mean at Square? Um, it means the name, the definition is truly in the name. It means the success of our customer. And so while, yes, the majority of our, of our team is contact center agents, there's actually a pretty healthy technology side as well. So we have a number of engineers, data scientists, machine learning specialists, uh, data analytics folks, project managers, program managers that really help tell the story through insights and, and storytelling about what's working well within our ecosystem, but more importantly, what's not. What are the needs that we're not meeting for customers? Where are our competitors winning over us? We wanna make sure that we have a very, um, uh, keen eye line of sight onto all of the things that need improvement and that that's where that technical back of the house function really comes into play. Uh, but customer success at Square, I would say means that we are 
making sure that our customers are taking full advantage of every aspect of our ecosystem that makes sense for their unique needs and that they're really enjoying the ride along the way. So a lot of um, companies during COVID obviously went remote and many employees never went back. And I understand that your um, company, your global team is fully remote. What are some of the, the challenges of managing a fully remote con- um, customer success team? Yeah, so we are a fully remote team, but that means that everybody has the option of being fully remote. We have a number of very beautiful offices around the world, uh, and our employees are free to go in every single day if they would like, but of course they never have to if they prefer not. I'm one of those people in the latter. I've been like twice in the last two years. Um, And it is quite challenging when you have thousands of people all over the planet doing their own thing in their house. Um, there's, I think, more pros and cons to it, but some of the cons that we see are, uh, especially for the people who we've hired post-pandemic that never had that full in-office experience, it's hard for them to understand the full magnitude of the magic of Square um, because they weren't there when everyone was in the offices. So trying to find small ways to recreate that, to help strengthen and deepen the pride that they have in their role their understanding of how their position plays the overall strategy of the company um, and making sure that we're able to help them build interpersonal relationships, particularly those that um, where your teammate may be on the other side of the world. So uh, those interconnectivity things are, are, are challenges. I think a lot of organizations that are still fully remote are struggling with. I think that we do really well uh, compared to a lot of them, but we definitely haven't perfected the, the solution there quite yet. Uh, the pros for me mean that we are able to no longer be held hostage by where our physical offices are as it relates to finding new talent. Um, so while we definitely still do hire in the cities where our offices are, we are very open uh, to hiring literally anywhere. And so what that means is that we're not able to create these smaller hubs. Um, So for instance, I've started up what I would call hubs in Columbus, Ohio, as well as Houston, Texas, where we don't have a physical footprint, but we now have dozens and dozens of employees there who are working remotely and are able to come together ever so often, whenever they'd like um, in a physical environment. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And what would you say is different about Square? Just thinking of from a leadership perspective, because I know, There's a difference with a company that is very, very customer centric and they call that out and they say, we differentiate on being customer centric from companies that just have a contact center. So could you just paint the picture of, from a leadership perspective, how leading and the perception of the contact center and the customer success team is different at Square as opposed to other companies? Um, Our leadership team specifically, I think is what makes us stand out as a differentiating factor. Everyone from our, this overall CEO of Block, Jack Dorsey, to Square CEO, Alyssa Henry, and, my, and myself, um, are just obsessed with the customer experience. What does working with our products look and feel like to our customers? We're really understanding that their pain and standing up projects uh, solely um, to get at solving that particular pain. And so I think that most organizations try to build a product and see out their vision uh, and of course, they all, I'm sure, care about how their their products are received by their customer base. But I think Square goes a step further by putting ourselves in the shoes of our customers quite frequently. We have something called Empathy Labs that we do where we really just take on the role of a customer and try to utilize our products from beginning to end just to understand where the pain is. Um, we, we do tons of customer focus groups surveys, we're constantly collecting feedback, and we truly look at all of that feedback and slice it a thousand different ways to help us figure out what our overall company strategy should be, as well as the strategy of the many teams that make up the whole of Square. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that comes up in this area a lot in customer experience is profits. And, you know, practitioners, I'm sure you, you meet practitioners from other companies, other industries, they struggle to prove the ROI of what they're doing and they're not getting the budgets that they need, especially post COVID. Mm -hmm. They're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. What advice do you have for our practitioners that are listening that want to show the ROI that want to prove this is valuable, but are struggling to do so? Yeah. The first I would say is I I hear you. I, I feel the same struggle and I felt it for many years. And to your point, it is see, it does seem to be worsening post COVID. Um, I think as CEOs and boards are looking at the, the total bucket of money they have to work with 
they have to be very thoughtful about if I have a dollar to spend, do I put it on the support experience? Do I reinvest it in R&D or something of that nature? Do I further my marketing spend? Um, and so it is quite challenging for um, execs like myself who are having to make those fiscal decisions. But the thing I would say is you need to think about customer experience as a product. Um, and so what I do is look at my business the same way our product GMs do. I think about it um, from a perspective of how many customers are we bringing in, who's calling, how many people are calling into our phone line with curiosity about Square and being able to start capturing that data about we spoke to them and they therefore converted has been huge in telling the story of how we're not solely a cost center. Um, I've invested heavily in all things analytics, uh, data engineering to help me really tell the story of the profitability that we bring, because in a lot of ways that's often invisible. So other areas such as churn reduction is something that I feel is immense amount of responsibility for, but it's sometimes difficult to tell the narrative in a definitive factual way that just because one of my agents may have spoken to this customer, they therefore did not end up churning. But we have learned through analytics and other data science uh, methodologies a way to do to do exactly that. And so um, having a very analytical mindset and, and, and having a maniacal focus on telling your story using hard numbers and not just your feelings um, is key to making sure that you are uh, making a case for the budget that you're requesting to this, that it carries as much merit as those that the product teams and other teams may be as well. Um, I think simultaneously, you've got to um, make sure that you're just always having a loud voice at the organization and having a seat at the right tables where you're reminding folks that are in those decision-making positions the importance of caring for the customer's experience um, and telling that narrative for them in a very plain way through things like customer journey mapping, um, various insights reports that you could be creating, and then think of fun, creative ways to get the people who are in those decision-making seats to actually interact with the customers and hear the pain firsthand. Doing um, uh, all of that stuff together will help transform you from being just the folks who answer the phone to being thought of like a product team. Naomi, do you have a creative story, an example of a time where you use creativity to serve up the full picture of customer experience and how important it is to the business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think customer journey mapping is one of my most favorite tools that I like to use because very often when some, especially when something goes bad, you hear about it from a segment perspective, meaning you hear one phone call um, or you read one bad customer interaction that was over email. But you really have to understand the full pain that that customer went through from their perspective um, looking at it from their vantage point from beginning to end. And so when you lay all of the various segments together and you total up the total amount of time that they spent, how many times they got transferred, how many people they had to speak to, uh, how long they were on hold, and you tell it from that viewpoint, it very much makes the pain be highlighted and helps to start an action or code read uh, across your organization to be called. And so I've, I've had, I can think of a number of examples where unfortunately the company that I was at dropped the ball um, and we didn't realize the magnitude of how much we had dropped the ball until we looked at the entire experience for the customer and not just a particular segment uh, that might have originally been called to our view. So customer journey mapping is literally helping you tell the story of the customer, paint the picture. Is there a key to doing customer journey mapping well that you could share with us? Yeah, I think it's making sure that you don't lose sight of the analytics. I think often when I see customer journeys at other companies that I might um, be advising or something of that nature, they lean too far into the emotional side, the feeling side of it, which is very important. You do want to bring some of that in. But it has to be backed up with hard facts that that way your audience doesn't think that you're just overly emotional because you're the CS person. Um, you want to make sure that they are understanding, wow, you know, Naomi's riled up, but she's right to be riled up because of all of these, da these data points that she is presenting us with. And so I think the key to success with the customer journey map is um, the hybrid model, I would say, with, of analytics, lots of numbers, lots of proof that's indisputable combined with the feelings, the emotions, the customer verbatims that help bring it to life. 
So we're reaching the third chapter of the podcast together. I want to switch gears from contact center and customer success to look more at your industry, financial services. Financial services has been incredibly disrupted in the last 10, 15 years. Square has obviously been part of the ride, but what are the opportunities and challenges of working in such a fast paced, constantly disruptive and disrupting industry like finance and tech? Yeah, absolutely. I think the fast pace at which technology just continues to evolve is both a gift and a curse because as soon as you get something developed and rolled out, um, your competitors might come up with something that's newer, faster, shinier. And so you've got to really make sure that you are playing chess, not checkers. Um, so while sometimes rollout of new technological advancements can take years to be uh, in development, you have to also be always thinking about the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Uh, and so right now, obviously, artificial intelligence is huge and Square is leaning into this very heavily. Um, we've been investing in AI tools and automation since 2018. And we're now really on a mission to integrate the power of AI into our full ex ex uh, support experiences. Um, and so we're going to do that by increasing efficiency uh, and getting our customers instant answers that aren't just uh, fast, but they're also correct. Um, and so really having a, a keen eye on the future um, and not being, don't shy away from technology um, as a solution for yourself. But we are also thinking about how we can lean into technology as a solution for our customers as it relates to their customers and how they're able to serve them. I was recently on LinkedIn and there was a post trending about generative AI and chat GPT and if companies have rules and regulations and a stance around it for employees. And because not every company has one, the article and the content on LinkedIn was saying there's just this lack of fairness because some employees are using it, some are not. Do you have any advice for our uh, leaders that are listening that need to come out for their employees with some kind of stance on these technologies like AI, generative AI, but don't have one yet and don't really know where to start? Yeah, absolutely. I think you definitely need one and you need to have one quickly unless you're going to just flat out ban it. Um, and, and minus you actually banning AI being introduced or utilized within your organization, then you should have some type of ground rules, some expectations, some guardrails that you want your, your employees to work within. Um, and it's, I think it's also okay right now while we're all just beginning to lean into AI to make sure that this is a policy, whatever policy that you write, that you do caveat it with that it is going to be subject to change and it might evolve quite frequently as you learn more as there becomes more of a regulatory landscape from a government perspective, as the technology advances more and uh, we're more aware of what it's capable of, you may have to tweak your policy. So I think it's okay to say, here are some general guardrails to begin with, but this is what we are going to be establishing based on what we know right now. And we do reserve the right to, to change those in the future. Um, I think that it's important to remember to protect your customer's data when you are utilizing AI um, and, and be careful whether you're using APIs or other ways to connect um, artificial intelligence into your own systems um, that you're mindful and thoughtful about what could go wrong. Um, make sure you're doing your research on companies that have begun to use AI, whether very recently or in years past, and um, maybe things didn't go quite the way that they'd hoped they would, so that you can learn from those organizations and mistakes. Um, make sure that you're consulting with your cybersecurity professionals, um, but also make sure that you are striking the right balance between caring for the risk without stifling innovation. Um, and that's a very fine line to have to, to toe. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And just from your perspective at Square, have you seen AI eliminate contact center jobs or supplement them? Um, definitely not eliminate. We, we, our plan is that the um, AI should be able to supplement the jobs. I think what will happen, and this is probably like two years away, this is not anytime soon, what will likely happen is that we will have done such a good job bringing in AI and other technologies uh, platforms that will answer the easier questions that our customers have. So what will likely happen is that our phone calls become lengthier and more complex in nature because AI is handling the easy ones and the harder, much more nuanced questions will get through to our human, um, our human advocates on the phones. Um, but we don't see a need to reduce staff. We, we think that AI should let us have 
uh, or it should allow us to uh, loosen up the reins on how long they can stay on the phone with the customer and really get into the nitty gritty with the complex situations that they present us with. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to hear. Everybody out there, if you're afraid about AI taking your job, fear not. Um, maybe look for a job at Square. Um, Naomi, let's get into the fun last part of the podcast. Are you game to take some rapid fire questions? I am. Let's go. All right. All right, Naomi, what does your morning routine look like? Um, I start off with prayer uh, and then I go outside and I read the news. I probably read too much news. I spend about 45 minutes every morning just reading the news all around the world. Um, I listen to my favorite podcast. I try to get in a morning job uh, and take my dogs to the park if I can. Uh, and then I hop in and start working right away. All right. Do you have a unique leadership hack that helped get you to where you are today? Yes, my unique leadership uh, hack outside of really tailoring my style to the individual, I think that's the biggest thing, um, has been I keep my inbox on zero. I never have more than two or three unread emails at any time. Um, it, it, to me, I liken it to like cleaning your house. If you clean your house really well and you just tidy up constantly, it never really gets dirty again. And that's the same process that I use at work. If I just stay on top of everything, my slacks, my uh, emails, then they just always stay up to date and I never really feel that stressed out. Mm -hmm. Got it. What do you do to relax at the end of a hectic day? Going outside if the weather is great. I love being outside. Again, dogs to the park, FaceTime, FaceTiming with my parents or other family members, um, watching a good show. I love binging a really, really good show as well. So those kind of things help. What is your favorite leadership book or resource? Um, favorite leadership book is probably Lean In. Um, I absolutely love that book. I think it does a good job of showcasing uh, the struggles that female executives have to go through to, link, to even the playing field, if you will, with our male counterparts. And it's a really fun read as well. Yeah, I've read it too. And yeah, very impactful. Very, I think ahead of its time it was. All right. Yeah. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Uh, perfect happiness for me is having complete ownership of my time. Um, so being able to make sure that I am living a life where at any given moment, whatever I'm doing is something that I want to be doing, nothing that I feel forced to do. Um, so that means that I'm very particular about where I spend my time, how I spend my time, and certainly the job that I work because I do that more than anything. Um, and for me, that is absolute bliss. What is one mental health strategy for managing hard days? Um, I have this thing, it's going to sound, I know I have to say it quickly because this is rapid fire, so I'll try not to make it sound no, you too don't. It's like, okay. <laughs> crazy. Okay, wonderful. Um, but I have this philosophy that I adopted like out of the blue a couple of years ago, and I call it the deathbed mentality. And what I mean by that is I ask myself when I have a really stressful day or something's really gotten on my nerves or I'm freaked out or I feel like anxiety or something, and I just calm myself down and I say, okay, the 70 years from now, hopefully, when you're laying on your deathbed, is this going to actually matter? And if the answer is no, somehow that just gives me this, this sense of peace and calm. That doesn't mean I don't worry about it anymore, but it definitely makes me realize, okay, this is not the end of the world. This is probably some first world problem that really isn't even a real problem. Let's get to solutioning and move on with our life. If the answer is yes, though, this is going to bother me when I'm on my deathbed, then I know that this is something that's very important to me and I go into hyper solution mode to really figure out how to change the course of this because the last thing that I want in life is uh, regrets. And so asking myself that simple question has really helped me reframe my mind quickly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's great. What is your favorite type of vacation? Um, I've been to over 90 countries. And so I think my favorite types of countries are the most unique, the ones that are um, the most unlike America. And so uh, I love Sri Lanka. So I like a, a mixture of beach, but um, just really beautiful natural landscapes as well is, is probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. Great. If you could have lunch with anyone dead or alive, Naomi, who would it be? Oh, wow. I didn't know that was going to come. Um, Probably Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. Yep, very impactful man. And lastly, if you had to describe your outlook in one quick motto, what would it be? Um, probably this too shall pass. 
hence the death and mi- deathbed mentality. <laughs> mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, love it. Well, this has been so fun getting to know you. I hope you'll come back next year and tell us more about how it's going over at Square. And I just really thank you for your time today, Naomi. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. All of you have been tuning into the Modern Customer Podcast. If you're interested, please check out Square to learn more. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.